Francis Prabha. Why don't we give God a big round of applause? Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. If you are watching online, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, just keep us in our prayer, in your prayer, as we launch our city site next Sunday. I'm very excited, the team, very, very excited. So keep us in your prayer. If you know anyone who live in the inner city who are not yet connected to a church home yet, please invite them. Uh, you can check out our website for more details. They will be fantastic. Amen. I want to allow more space and more room at the end of the message uh, just to pray with you and just to stand with you and receive that commissioning uh, from the Holy Spirit right at the end of the message. So uh, let me just go straight into uh, the Scripture. Let me just lay some foundation here, some scriptural or biblical context in regards of what I'm about to talk about this morning. Now, how many have heard this word, ecclesia, before? Can I see your hand? All right, all right, very good, very good. Ecclesia. See, the biblical word translated as church is ecclesia. Somebody say ecclesia. Say it again, ecclesia. So in the original Greek, ecclesia, it simply means the call out assembly people of God. Essentially, it is the assembly people of God. So every time if you read through the New Testament, you understand that New Testament uses this word ecclesia in two different forms. Sometimes it refers to the people of God who gathered in one location. This is our usual idea of our local church, the gathered church. And sometimes it refers to the people of God wherever they might find themselves. Somebody say wherever. Say that again, wherever. So that is the scattered church. Both are true church. Both are equally important. See, we invite people into the church building. That is the gathered church. And we also take the kingdom of God to wherever people are. That's the scattered church. The scattered church is positioned wherever you are right now. In your homes, in your unis, in your schools, in your workplace, in your retirement village, wherever you are, that's the scattered church. Sometimes people refer this as the marketplace ministry. You read it. Some people, some authors. And sometimes they refer this as engaging with your own world type of ministry. That is why Jesus focused more on the marketplace than in a monastery. Because this is where most people spend most of their waking hours. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you read through the life of Jesus out of his 132 public appearances in the New Testament, do you know that 122 of them occur in the marketplace? 52 parables Jesus told. Read it through. 45 of them had a workplace context. If you read through 40 divine encounters and miracles listed in the book of Acts, I read through them. Do you know 39 of them had a marketplace context? See, we invite people. That's great. That's a true church. We invite people into this church building. Great celebration. Worship God. That's great. That's gather church. But don't forget that God has empowered you, commissioned you, released you wherever you are in your own world, engaging with them. Why? To shape the society. In the business world, the political arena, the entertainment world, the arts, the services. Let me tell you what, because the moment we stop doing that as a scattered church, the church that started as a movement in the Booth of Acts will become a monument. If we're not careful. Are you with me? So in the next few minutes, what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to go through uh, the reason why God placed you wherever you are. There are many reasons, but I'm just going to give you three out of the many reasons. Uh, if you're taking notes, write this down. The reason God placed you wherever you are right now as a scattered church right there in the marketplace, in your workplace, in your homes, in your families, the reason is, number one, is to bring revelation of who God is is to reveal who God is. Everybody say revelation. revelation. Said it again, revelation. revelation. Is to bring revelation of who God is. You can reveal God 
through your work, through your arts, through your books, through your songs, through your lyrics, through your media, through your innovation, through your creativity, you name it. You can reveal God through your work. How many of you know that Jesus was a carpenter? We preach about Savior, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. But he was a carpenter too. He was a carpenter. Can you imagine people at, at the table that met by Jesus? Just imagine it. Can you imagine that the foundation of their houses were fit and cut by the Savior himself as a carpenter? Even their oxen may have worn Jesus made yokes, the Jesus brand. So if you read through the messages of Jesus, when he, every time when he preached, very often as the communicator, we study how Jesus preached. When he preached, he wasn't just simply using a catchy metaphor. And very often, as I study his life, his way, very often he drew upon his own experience as a craftsman, as a carpenter. So when Jesus said, man, you gotta, you got to dig deep and lay the foundation, he knew exactly what he was talking about. When he said, well, take my yoke, man. My yoke is easy. My load is light. People knew exactly what he was talking about. He was a carpenter. What I'm saying to you is Jesus was using his work to communicate the message of God. My question to you is today, if you're watching online as well, what kind of message are you communicating to people through your work? Let me, let me just go deeper. What, what kind of God are you revealing to others through you? What kind of God? Ask yourself, what, what kind of God? I ask myself all the time, what kind of God are you revealing to others through you? See, I, I work in different places before, before I took on this role, before I joined City Life Church. Wherever I go, this is the golden rule. You want to know the golden rule? Let me, let me tell you. Wherever I work, this is the golden rule. If I cannot make people see the light, how many of you know that God is the light? If I cannot make people, wherever I am, if I cannot make people see the light, I will at least make them feel the heat. <laughs> Come on, it's a principle. If I can't make people feel and see God because of the scale, the spiritual scale, I will at least make them feel love. Because God is love. Are you with me? What, what kind of God? What kind of God are you revealing to others through you? Number one is to bring transformation. Number one is to bring revelation of who God is. Second one, I'm going to go straight into it, is to bring transformation. God placed you wherever you are is to make a change. Is to bring transformation in your workplace, in your families. Is to bring transformation. I, I understand that faith is personal. Your faith, my faith. It's very personal, personal relationship with God. But the implication should be social. Let me say that again. Faith is personal, but the implication is social. It should be social transformation. You are sent by God into your world to engage with your world to make a change. How many of you heard this phrase before? <laughs> uh, you are in the world, but not of the world. Can I see your hand? A very, very famous subculture Christian is part of the verses as well. You are in the world and not of the world. Uh, wh what does it really mean? I mean, people preach about that. I mean, every meeting that I go to, you are in the world and not out of the world. All of that. But what does it really mean? As I study the, the life of Martin Luther King, really, really encouraging. You, you should. Martin Luther King, you know, when he was a boy, young boy, he worked in a stable. It, it was a very tough job. And one day, he didn't have time to clean himself up, so he went straight to his school from the stable, an animal stable. And the moment he walked into this classroom, obviously one of his classmates with a clear intention to embarrass him. You know what he said? He said to Martin, Martin, man, you, 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 you smell like an animal. You smell like a meal. And to that, you know what Martin replied? It's so profound. Listen to what he replied. This is what he said. Yes, that's true, I smell like a meal, but as long as I don't think like one, as long as I don't act like one, it doesn't really matter. Let me tell you what, no matter how undesirable your working environment is, 
no matter how undesirable your family gathering is, you drag your feet to the family gathering, no matter how undesirable the environment is, let me tell you what, don't let the toxicity around it to affect the way you think and to affect the way you act. Protect your mind. Protect your action. And maybe some of you here, I felt that this morning, maybe you have a desire maybe to make a change wherever you are right now. In your workplace, you, you took on this job, this role, and said, I want to make a change. I want to make a change. You have that desire. You started so well, but somehow something somewhere something happened and you stop being a change agent and in fact you've been changed by its environment you have become the very thing that you set to make a change in the first place and i really encourage you to study the the life of three three characters that I encourage you to study i'm not going to go into that i spent many months doing this character study uh, the life of daniel joseph esther go through it why? Because God placed them in such an ungodly nation. Read through their story. Ungodly nation. And God placed Joseph in Egypt to make a change. God placed Daniel in Babylon to make a change. God placed Esther in Persia to make a change. God placed in an ungodly nation to make a change. As I study their life, and I'm not going to go very deep into that, but I can summarize it in three common things that they all had. Number one, they all started as slaves. Number one, they all started as slaves. Wherever you are right now, regardless of your position or your title, do not despise your small beginnings. They all started as slaves. Number two, they all ended up being a voice of change in the nation. A voice of change. How did it happen? Number three, that's the common thing. They're all grounded and deeply rooted in God's way and God's truth. You want to make a change wherever you are, deeply grounded in God's way and God's truth. Now, let me, let me just give you a disclaimer right now. I don't want to receive any email. And <laughs> let me give you a disclaimer. There's always a disclaimer. I don't want you to go out from this place and say, God will say, God placed me in an ungodly nation, ungodly place to make a change. If, if, let me give you an example. You're going to have wisdom as well. If, if you struggle with, for example, this is just an example. If you struggle with alcohol issue, how many of you know that it is not wise or common sense will tell you that it is not wise for you to be an alcohol mixer or a bartender? All right? Apostle Paul said all things are what? Permissible, but not all things are beneficial. So you're going to apply wisdom. But in general, God plays you wherever you are to make a change. Can somebody say Amen. Maybe some of you, you say that, oh, I'm the only Christian. I'm the only believer in my company, in my family. How can I make a change? It's just few of us. How can we make a change in the Melbourne city? It's just a handful of people we stand. How can we make a change? As I read through the kingdom, like, for example, Matthew 13, verse 33, it says this, the kingdom of God is like yeast. Women used to make bread. It permeated through every part of the door. God doesn't need a lot. He only needs a few Bible-believing, spirit-filled people committed to God's way and God's truth to make a change wherever you are. Can somebody say amen? So number one is to bring revelation who God is. Very simple. Number two is to bring transformation. Number three, this is where I want to go deeper. Number three is to bring demonstration of God's power. Everybody say Demonstration. Somebody said, demonstration of God's power. It's to bring transformation of God's power wherever you, we are. See, we always preach about this gospel of love. How many of you know that as believers, we accept this gospel of love? This gospel of love is also known as gospel of power. Just read through the life of Jesus, the resurrection. It is a power. It is a gospel of power. And the reason God plays you wherever you are right now, I want to break your mindset about uh, this perspective. God plays you right wherever you are right now is to demonstrate His power. 
And I'm going to go deeper. Not only that, I felt like this is the season wherever God plays you, He's going to use whatever that is in your hand to demonstrate His power. This is second layer. Wherever He plays you, He's going to use whatever that is in your hand to perform miracles, to demonstrate God's power. God said to Moses very clearly, what, what, what He asked Moses, what, what is this in your hand? What is in your hand? You know, Moses said, it is a staff. In one translation, Moses said, ah, it's just a stick. Exodus 4, God said to Moses, well, I'm going to use that to perform miracles through it. And I want you to understand that the reason God said that is so profound and so significant because that staff, that stick, it was a symbol of Moses' job as a shepherd. I, I, God wanted Moses to look at his job for more than years, like decades of as a shepherd. He wanted Moses to look at his job in a powerful, in a new way. Essentially, I really believe that what God is saying to so many of you here this morning is that God going to use your profession, He's going to use your vocation, He's going to use your occupation to perform miracles through it. See, David did not fight Goliath as a war general. He fought Goliath as a shepherd. He did not use or wear King Saul's armour to defeat Goliath even though it was offered to him because they thought that king's armor, King Saul's armor was better too. No, no, no. David said, I'm going to use whatever that is in my hand. What is that? A tooth of his trait, a sling and a stone. Because in those times, in biblical context, shepherds, it is so common that to keep their safety, to keep a distance, they use a sling and a stone to protect their flock. What I'm saying to you is, Wherever God places you right now in this season, He's going to use whatever that is in your hand, your skill set, the tools of your trade. He's going to use it and to perform miracles through it and demonstrate His power. Man, thinking about, talking about power, I'm so excited. I know I don't show it, but I'm telling you on the inside, it's like firecrackers ready for the launch for next week. A walking firecrackers. You can ask Andrew, just walking firecrackers. And I'm ready for the launch. And, and, and it's just right in the heart of the city, in our MIT buildings surrounded with migrant students and migrant families and international students and young adults and younger generation. I'm so excited. And it, right there in the RMIT. I mean, it reminded me so much when I was a student at Monash University uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Do you know that in 2001, I also, we also planted, we were a handful of people, maybe 10, 12 people, we planted a church right there in the heart of Monash University in Kuala Lumpur. It was almost like a sense of deja vu. It reminded me so much, almost, God going to do it again. God going to do it again. When I was a student at Monash, Kuala Lumpur, I was, uh, I was known to, uh, uh, to be a, just a church goer. Nothing more, nothing less. And when, when they see me, they say, ah, let's go in, there's, there's a church goer, church goer, church goer. But things began to change after an incident that took place uh, in the foyer at Monash University. And what happened, it was uh, in a school, cafe, uh, in a uni cafeteria, like a student union kind of thing, Monash Uni. I was sitting there having lunch. It was packed, busy time, afternoon lunch time. And I saw this young lady just came and, and she sat beside me. And immediately, I, 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 can, I realized that her, her movement was a bit shaky. But true enough, just within a minute, just a minute, and I watched the whole thing, sitting beside me, she just went black out, and she fell. The moment she fell, her head slammed and, and just hit the corner of the table, the, the, the lunch table, and, and, and fell to the ground and went unconscious, just right there in front of me, beside me. And of course, a lot of people rushed to her. Some called the ambulance and some of the first eight persons just came, surrounded with crowds. We're talking about Monash Uni right now in the public place. Now, this sounds ironic, but this is what happened. Just because I was sitting beside her, people automatically, I don't know why, assumed that I was her boyfriend. <laughs> just automatically sitting beside her, your boyfriend. 
And I remember the guy was so mad at me. He was looking at me, pointing at me and say, you should look after your girlfriend lah. <laughs> I was like, just because I'm sitting beside the Queen of England doesn't make me the King of England. I'm not a boyfriend. <laughs> then the rumor became more scandalous. And they thought that we had a fight. That's why I pushed her, that's why she fell. Then it dawned on me, it dawned on me at that time, it dawned on me that all of my life, I always ended up with the wrong people at the wrong time, at wrong places. And sometimes, if I can be honest with you, sometimes I question about wherever God placed me. How many question that? I would preach about that, but I question sometimes. She was unconscious, and I was like a, a man of suspect. And then it pushed me to do something that seemed so weird to the crowd. So weird, so ridiculous. You know what I did? I'm talking about Monash Uni in Kuala Lumpur, surrounded with people, lecturers, first aid person. I said a prayer publicly because I, I, have, no, I have no other solution. I just want to get out of it, so I said a prayer. If I can be honest with you, before I say it out from my mouth, this is exactly what my mind was thinking. God, please heal her, have mercy on her, wake her up to prove my innocence to the people. I, I, I did not push that girl. I, I, I'm not her boyfriend. So I stretched out my hand. This is what I did. This is where she bumped her head. I stretched out my hand towards the head. I said, very simple prayer, not a fancy one. Stretch out my hand. I said, God, please wake her up. Please heal her and wake her up in Jesus' name. And the moment when I say in Jesus' name, and all of a sudden, she took a deep breath. <gasps> and she, almost like she was awakened from a deep sleep. And the crowd clapped. <laughs> the professor clapped and cheered. And I tried to calm her. <laughs> we were on the floor, on the ground. I tried to calm her down. You know the next thing I asked her to do? True story. This is what I asked her to do. I said, you okay? And now, can you tell these people <laughs> that I'm not, I'm not your boyfriend? <laughs> This is what I said to her. It was, I was young. I was a student. All right. Then one week after that, the story continues. One week after that, I received a thank you note from her. And on that thank you note, uh, this is what she said. Uh, thank you for saving my life. If I can be honest with you, I never see myself as a hero in this story. I, I'm like a man of suspect on a crime scene. Are you, are you with me? Yeah. But the next statement, what she wrote, meant so much to me. And this is what she wrote. Thank you for your God. And then she began to share her story. And then we realized that she had been suffering from some form of brain disorder that caused seizure. As a result of that, she went blacked out in the first place for years. So she was still admitted to hospital. They did another scan on her brain. And then the doctors discovered that she was completely healed after the fall, they say. After the fall. But she knew it was our God who healed her. Then the news began to spread. I was walking around in campus. <laughs> and when they started giving me different nicknames, when they saw me, they looked at me and they said, Father Godwin. <laughs> some call me priest Godwin or healing gurus. And, and, and then some, some of them, when they saw me, they did this to me. And interestingly, this is what happened. After this incident, very randomly, every now and then for that three years when we planted a church, I was a student. So in that three years, I got a call, random people and said, my mom admitted to hospital, my friend admitted to hospital, can you just come and pray, pray for healing? And then all of a sudden, I realized that I was no longer just a church goer to them. I have become a church, a scattered church where people can tap into God's power and God's presence and God's healing touch. Mark 16, 17, verse 18, it says this, these signs will follow those who believe. Somebody said, believe. believe. Said it again, believe. believe. It did not say, hear me right, it did not say these signs will follow only pastors or healing evangelists. No, no. These signs will follow those who believe. Are you a believer? Are you a believer? Yes. Let me say that again. Are you a believer? Yes. 
these signs will follow after you if you believe in Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. And again, again, over 20 years in ministry, again, again, this is the most common question people ask. How, God, how, how do you perform miracles? And then the next question, always, what kind of subject or course should I take to learn how to perform miracles? Mostly from Bible college students, this is what they ask. But let me tell you what, miracles, this science, is not based on the level of your giftedness. It's not based on the level of your anointing or education or qualification or even your experience. This science will follow those who believe. It is based on the level of your belief. Work on your belief. You want to see God move through you? Work on your belief. Work on the levels. There are different levels of your belief. Work on the levels of your belief. Can you say amen to that? He put you there for a reason. It's to demonstrate God's power. Uh, I was working in a, a retail sector many years ago. One night, my wife at that time, she was a state manager. So they invited all the spouses to come and join them for dinner. So I came along. I was in the retail as well, very, very same industrial. Um, that night, we had a great dinner. After the dinner, we went for um, the bowling game at Cheston Shopping Centre. Is it Strike? I can't remember the name. It's a bowling centre, so we have a game or two. And halfway through the game, the head of the company, I get to be the CEO of the company at that time, and we were shocked. He sat down, and his face turned pale white. We were shocked to see his reaction. And what happened is that he had just dislocated his shoulder halfway through the game. Have you seen one before? Upper body crooked to one side, the shoulder is just hanging there. He was extremely painful. So of course, bystander just walked past and surrounded us. This is Chaston Shopping Centre, a public place. And one of the store managers called the ambulance. And my wife, my lovely wife, she just tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, it will take a while for the ambulance to arrive. Look at him, he's in pain. Why don't you pray for him right now, right here? And I looked at my wife. I said, you hear from God, you pray. <laughs> Is he here? Is she here? No. <laughs> then my wife gave me the look. Or the husband and wife. <laughs> she gave me the look, so I pray. <laughs> so I responded in obedience. Not sure to God or to my wife, but I responded. <laughs> stretching out my hand towards the, the company, the head of company. And I remember a very simple, and again, very simple prayer, stretching out my hand. And I said, God, please take away the pain and put his shoulder back together again. The moment I say, in Jesus' name, this is what happened. All of a sudden, even the bystanders, the store managers, we all could hear a cracking sound. <laughs> As if there was this invisible hand just pushing back his shoulder back to his original space. Completely take away the pain, just right there. Let me just rephrase that again. These signs will follow those who believe. Not just the pastors, believers. But you didn't realize it. That's why this message to unlock something in you and say that this sign will follow you wherever you go as long as you believe in Christ. Allow the Holy Spirit to move through you and in you, you will see miracles. The moment the scattered church receive that power from the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what, we'll begin to witness the church begin to shift, begin to shift from being a monument to being a great movement. If you allow the Holy Spirit, let me say, speak prophetically right now. If you allow it, it will happen. The church will begin to shift from being a historical church in the book of Acts it will become a supernatural church in today's world if you allow the Holy Spirit to move through you. We can never change the world by simply going to church. We can only change the world by being the church, a scattered church, positioned in the marketplace, in the workplace, in your homes, in your gatherings, in your retirement village, 
God wants to bring transformation, revelation, demonstration of His power wherever you are. Can somebody say amen? I want to spend some time, I want to allow room to, to pray um, with you. I'm going to invite the band to join me. I mean, let me just finish the, the sermon uh, with, with a story. Uh, two nights ago, Friday night, we celebrated as a family. We celebrated my mom's birthday, 70th birthday on, on Friday. It was a couple of months ago, but this is the only time we have a, t- have a chance to get as a family, the whole family, just to celebrate. And we hear some stories. We encourage her. 70th birthday. Uh, some of you know my mom. Uh, uh, she had been a teacher for more than 30 years before she retired. That's my mom. She had been a teacher many, many years for decades. And, and for those years, all I could remember is that she would pray for the students in the school when no one even noticed them. And a lot of the students, they were broken, they were abused and traumatized before. And she would fight for the welfare of other teachers when no one was fighting for hers. That's my mom. She would give generously to even the cleaners in the school. She would give generously to them, even though she had little for herself. Some of you know my story, come from a poor background, but it didn't stop her from being generous to someone even more needy. So she gave. That's my mom, very sacrificial. But she saw herself just an insignificant teacher, just doing her mundane job day in, day out. Nothing more, nothing less. And I never forget, uh, growing up as a kid, as in a family, I never forget she make a statement to me, and one night she say, All of my life, there's nothing to boast about my life except the goodness of God upon my children. And that's true because I am her prayer product. There's a reason why she said that. Some of you, you know my story, not all of you. Most of you, you do not know this part of my story. Growing up as a kid, I grew up in an abusive environment. I, I know what it meant uh, to live in fear and to lose your freedom. And I watched my mom went through that for decades, living like a prisoner. She loved God. But because she's the only Christian in the family, only believer at that time, and she was restricted to enter into the church building even for more than 30 years. 30 years. She was restricted, stripped away from her freedom to enter into a church building to encounter God. So for many, many years as a kid, but she would fight for her freedom to go to church. She would fight for my, my sister and myself to at least let my children go to church. And we went. Since Sunday school, we went to Sunday school. Since young, we went to church. Every Sunday, this is what I did. I came back, I would summarize the sermon to my mom. I would preach again to my mom. I said, this is what the pastor said. And then sometimes I would share the encounter that I have, the power, the presence that I encounter in church building, in services. My mom just sat there, quietly, weeping, crying, whispering. I wish I could be there for more than 30 years. To live like a freedom. Of course, things change. I led many of the families to Christ down the track. That's when we begin to see God's moving in the family. But I remember she was a teacher. And in one of the years, I remember the school started a Christian fellowship. A couple of students have enrolled, but no one was willing to lead that Christian fellowship. So my mom said, I'll, I'll do it. She has so much compassion on the kids. She loved those kids. She would share Bible stories. She would pray with them. And she would just feed them and hug them and pray and just see them as her own. That's my mom. And then she ran for many weeks. And one of the sessions, this is what my mom said. In one of the sessions, my mom looked at the kids and said, Next week, if you come back, when you come back next week, I'm going to tell you more Bible stories. Incredible storyteller. And she said, I'm going to get some treats for you. I'm going to get some candy and chocolate for you. Now, how many of you, if you're in kids' church ministry, you understand that there's a power of the word of mouth and the power of candy and chocolate? The following week, you know what happened? Hundreds of kids were waiting 
I'm not sure whether waiting for Christian fellowship or waiting for my mom, but I'm not sure whether waiting for chocolate or candy, but they were waiting. But none of them, a couple of teachers were involved in that Christian fellowship. None of them experienced ministers. None of them are. They didn't even have a building to contain hundreds of kids. You know what they did? They had an open air meeting in a school canteen. This is in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. A school canteen, open air meeting. They didn't have any musical instruments. Their, their voices were the only musical instruments. They didn't have a band like we do. So they have a CD player, an old one in their school, a very poor school. You know what they play? Uh, you feel a bit embarrassed to even share this. They play a mix tape, a mix album that I sent to my mom, or consists of different albums like Planet Shakers albums, a copy version of a Planet Shakers album, if I can put it this way. Don't judge me, it was a time that I didn't know anything about copyright issue. I repented since, all right? But God works in a wonderful way. They play a copy version of that CD. And what they did is that they began to sing. And that night, my mom just called me and said, you will not, have, you will not believe what happened. I said, tell me what happened. Trembling voice over the phone. And this is what she said. Over the phone, I was in Melbourne already. And she told me, while they were worshipping God, and while they were just waiting on God, playing that CD, and while they were just lingering in that moment, and all of a sudden, the presence of God fell upon that place so powerfully, so wonderfully. People, teachers begin to lift up their hands. The students begin dancing in joy with joy. And some of them, they were on their floor, encountering God, weeping and crying and shouting the name of Jesus in their own language. And this is the tangible manifestation of God's presence fell upon that place. And my mom just seized the opportunity. She shared a very simple message. She looked at the kids and she just started weeping, crying for the kids. Why? Because a lot of them, they've been through abuse. They've been through rejection, abandonment. They've been abused before, traumatized before. My mom just looked at them and said, I love you so much. You're so precious in my eyes. And then he, she went on and said, but there's one one who loves you even more. His name is Jesus. But this person will give you hope and the future. And she looked at the student, you will have hope and the future. And she kept repeating, you will have hope and the future. And my mom gave them an opportunity to receive Jesus that afternoon. And that afternoon in a school, small school in Kota Kinabalu, I was born in Sabah. In that small school, that afternoon, after that encounter, more than 400 students gave their life to Jesus for the You can give God a big round of applause. 400 students gave their life to Jesus that afternoon in a small school. And then revival began to spread to the rest of the school. And very soon, Buddhists kids will rock up in a Christian fellowship. Muslim kids will check out the Christian fellowship on the day that she retired. I never forget she shared the story. On the day that she retired, the school principal had to dismiss the school a few hours earlier. You know why? Because hundreds of kids were queuing up to say goodbye to my mom. Some drew her pictures. Some sang song in front of her, performed in front of her, wrote a poem for her, hugged her, gave her gift, hundreds of them. It was the teacher's turn to say goodbye. A Muslim colleague knelt down, grabbed her knee and begged her to stay and said, what would I do without you? And what really encouraged me in this story is this. For 30 years, 30 years, when she thought that she lost her freedom walking into the church building to encounter His power and His presence and God had a different story. God brought His power and His presence to wherever she was in her school. Our God cannot be boxed. His power cannot be limited. The advancement of God's kingdom cannot be stopped. Our faith should not be quarantined. How will Henry say, in the midst of generation screaming for answers, Christians are stuttering, Christians are stammering. For years, 
we heard the cry coming from the inner city in the city crying pride of hopelessness pride of homelessness we cannot ignore that cry anymore we will go starting for next Sunday we will go we'll position ourselves to respond to God with belief God place you wherever you are to bring transformation to bring revelation of who God is and to bring demonstration of God's power God will surprise you can I invite you to stand I want to quickly just allow room for Holy Spirit to move I want to pray it's the reason why God plays you wherever you are right now if you're joining us online you can respond as well the service is not over yet everyone just be still this is the most important part this is the reason I believe this is the purpose for this weekend I want to pray a prayer commissioning to release you I believe God wants to empower you the scriptures say that I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes I'm not ashamed so how do you overcome intimidation how do you overcome this timidity to share the gospel to bring transformation to bring revelation of who God is how do you overcome that you need the power of God to do the work of God just right there I felt that many of you you would love to respond and say I need that prayer I want to receive this prayer how many of you know that the disciples needed them the disciple discipled and taught by Jesus for three years by Jesus himself for three years but discipleship and teaching is not enough because on the day of Jesus arrest they fled away they reacted they were in fear they ran away from Jesus, they rejected Jesus. It was when after they received the power from the Holy Spirit, things began to shift. That the inner man, I don't have time to go into that, that spirit man began to unlock, began to untap, almost like a cap being lifted up and they let the Holy Spirit come through them. That's why when Peter preached, they heard him many times before, but this time it's different. When he preached, the scriptures say that the words cut deep into the hearts, they were fully converted. 3,000 people added into God's kingdom that day. You need that power. You need the power of God to do the work of God. Let me repeat that again. If you're watching online, you need the power of God to do the work of God. If you'd like to receive this prayer, we're going to stand together as a family and say, I want God to bring revelation through me. I want God to bring transformation. Maybe one of them, maybe two of them. I want God to demonstrate His power. Just lift up your hand and say, I want to respond to this call right now. I want to be commissioned. Just lift up your hands right now. Hi, so that I can see all over this auditorium. Hi, even if you're watching online, you can respond wherever you are right now. Now, this is what I'm going to do. This is very important. This is a year of steps. We talk about steps, but I really believe that this morning, God wants you to take a step of obedience. We're going to stand together together. If you respond that you need to receive that power, can I invite you to come forward right now, to join me right now? Just very quickly, just come forward right now. Why don't we give them a big round of applause? Come on, come on, just quickly, quickly, quickly. Just come forward. Uh, come on, just keep clapping. Keep clapping. Come on, come on, just come forward. I'll wait for you on the balcony. Just come forward. Just come very close to me to allow space for people to come forward. Just get, just come straight to me. Closer, closer. I want more people to come. I want to give space. I don't want you to stand on the aisle. Just come very forward. Quickly, 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 quickly. You're on the balcony. I'll wait for you. Very quickly. Come, come, come. Respond. Respond. Take a step of obedience. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There are more people coming. Can you just get, come closer? Thank you. Thank you. right there but people are still coming forward you can be there on the aisle I know there's not much space here just right there if you can't come forward you're on the balcony just right wherever you are right now you're watching online right now 
right now. There's someone in the hospital right now watching online. God gonna bring peace. You will understand not just the concept of peace. God gonna bring the Prince of Peace to you right now. If you're watching online, you are in the hospital. God gonna bring peace. God gonna bring you through whatever season you're going through right now. He's gonna give you strength right now. You're watching online right now. And right here, wherever we are, people responded right now. Just oh, can I get you to lift up your hands right now, very slowly. Very slow, the music, very slow. This is what I'm going to do right now. Many of you, you are believers. And some of you are leaders. Just right there, there's a reason why you're poured up in tears right now. Very slow, very still, very still. There's a reason why you're crying, weeping. Some of you are laughing. God wants to honor your step of obedience. That's just faith step. But many of you right now, I can sense it. A lot of you, you want to receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get the leaders. I, I know there's no space. I'm going to get the leaders and the pastors, the prayer team to join me after the service, after the message. I want you to stay after that, but I'm going to pray for you right now. But after the message, I want you to stay. The pastors, the prayer team going to minister to you individually. This is what I'm going to do. Just lift up your hands right now. How do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's very easy. It's a beautiful gift of God. It does not come to us by grace. It comes to us by grace and not by our own effort. Let me just clarify that. It comes to you by faith and grace and not by your own strive or effort. How do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The same way you receive Jesus, by faith. And sometimes you don't feel it. Sometimes you will feel it. Like many of you right now, you are shaking, you are crying out. He wants to pour out more upon you. He wants to release you right now. Just right there, you receive it by faith. And the moment you put that faith in action, that's you will begin to witness the demonstration of God's power through you. Just lift up your hands right now. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your power. Give me your power to do your work. Release me into wherever I am right now. Set me free. Give me the anointing. Give me the obedience. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Receive it right now. Just right there. Right there. Just receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Just right there. We're going to go back into worship. After the worship, prayer team, pastors, I want you to come and pray for them. If you need prayers, just stay where you are. I want you to lift up your hands across the auditorium right now, including online. You're watching right now. Lift up your hands right now. I'm going to pray a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we're going to go back into worship after the prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the step of obedience they have taken today. Such a significant step right now. Lord, I pray that wherever they are, you're going to use them to bring transformation, to bring revelation, to bring demonstration of your power. So right now, we break every spirit of fear. We break every spirit of intimidation over their lives right now. We break all caps of caps of limitation. There's limitations over your lives right now, over your minds right now. We're going to break it in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that stir up the fire. Come on, come on. Stir up that fire right now. Stir up their faith. Stir up their spirit within them right now. Release them. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom to be advanced in a powerful way that the gates of hell shall never ever prevent against her. Prevent against this church will never happen. Let your kingdom be advanced. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say, come on, everybody say, why don't we give God a big round of applause? Come on, lift up your hands. Worship Him right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, lift up your hands. Worship Him. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 